knihovně Václava Havla pro vás každý měsíc připravujeme až 20 akcí bez vstupného. Každý měsíc až 20 rozhovorů, debat a vzdělávacích videí na havelchannel.cz. Spolupracujeme s více než tisícovkou učitelů napříč republikou. Pořádáme workshopy, výstavy, vydáváme knihy. Náš archiv čítá přes 60 tisíc obrazových a psaných dokumentů. Každý rok udělujeme cenu Václava Havla za lidská práva bojovníkům za svobodu z celého světa. Pomozte nám i vy udržovat odkaz Václava Havla živý a přispějte na naši činnost na www.havelnavždy.cz. Děkujeme. So good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, uh, dear esteemed guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great honor to welcome at Charles University, Professor Luke van Middelaar, who's uh, going to give us today a clevering lecture. Um, Charles University is proud partner to these occasions, and uh, I'm really happy to see plenty of our students and our colleagues and also guests uh, from uh, from public. Uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, His Excellency, uh, Ambassador of Netherlands, uh, to also welcome you by a few words, and I'm really looking forward to this evening and the lecture. Thank you that you uh, pay your paid your visit to Charles University, and please, Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, dear rector, excellencies, vice governor, um, professors, uh, dear Michael, there he is, dear Luke, alumni, of course, this is an evening for the alumni, students, ladies and gentlemen, uh, indeed, I, I realize that I'm standing between, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the preeminent speakers here, Luke and, and Michael, so I'll keep it short. But, um, well, first of all, pleasure being here, dear Madam Rector, pleasure being here at the Charles University, the oldest university in Central Europe. And um, uh, also a warm welcome to both the audience uh, here present and the audience online through the Havel Channel. Just a smart, smart uh, or a short introduction. Uh, every year there's a, a Cleveringa lecture. Um, I think you, some of the background information for the ones not familiar, of course, the alumni know. The alumni from Leiden University, hopefully they're here in big numbers. Uh, uh, but otherwise, uh, just a short introduction. Cleveringa was a professor in Leiden who basically stood up to the Nazi occupiers in November 1940, six months after the occupation, when actually his uh, promoter was fired, was a Jewish professor named Meyers, and he sort of controlled his anger, um, but gave a very, I would say, very controlled, but very sharp speech uh, at the time that Professor Meyers was supposed to give his lecture. Um, that speech was copied, found its way through the Netherlands uh, to other universities, and it led to a student strike after which Leiden University was closed for the duration of the war. So a very courageous act, and since then Leiden University, uh, of which I am, by the way, also an alumni, I'm proud of it, um, Leiden University still honors the name of uh, Mr. Klevinga by holding the Klevinga Lecture. We do that in uh, about uh, 20 cities in the Netherlands itself, but also always abroad uh, in the major cities, London, Paris, uh, New York, etc., and of course also Prague. Um, for the past two years, because of COVID, there wasn't a Klevinga uh, lecture until last year. And then we figured it was a good reason I arrived as a new ambassador here in Prague to team up with the Havel Library, because there's a certain resemblance. Uh, Certainly, Havel, of course, was a statesman. Klevinga was an academic. But both of them, you know, at the right moment, stood up uh, and let their conscience speak. And, of course, well, in the beautiful words of, of Havel, didn't want to live in a lie. Uh, and since then, they, both of them are an inspiring example. Well, we live in uh, hectic times. Uh, again, we see circumstances uh, under which, you know, people stand up and speak their conscience. I'm talking about the, uh, the Ukraine. Um, there actually it's not just individuals but large numbers of people who stand up. Um, it's, a, it's a big inspiration. I must also say it's, it's a different league but the Czech Republic is have, taking the lead in, uh, in, in Europe. Quite admirable serving here as an ambassador to see what the, uh, the war in Ukraine uh, 
uh, led to, what kind of the inspiration it, it's given the, uh, the Czech uh, political class, but also the Czech uh, uh, population. And that's an, an inspi inspiration, I would say, to us Western Europeans who are a little bit further away and who have never experienced the brutal oppression of Russia and the communist system. Um, I'm trying to wrap up because, I, as I said, I'm standing between you and the main speakers. Um, yeah, one thing I'd also like to remind you, of course, that this is uh, a couple of months ago in this very same building, we had uh, the uh, German Bundeskanzler um, who uh, defined Russian's invasion of Ukraine as a turning point for Europe, a uh, Zeitenwende, and he stressed the need for a more geopolitical European Union. And of course, it's no coincidence that the speaker which we asked the, professor, the University of Leiden to provide us Mr. Luc van Middelaar um, is exactly one of the, well, I would say one of the most, uh, most uh, preeminent, um, I would say, advocates of a more geopolitical approach for the European Union. Tonight, Professor Luc van Middelaar will share his vision of the future of Europe, Europe after the Zeitenwende, beautiful German word, while keeping an eye on the heroes who have carried our leg legacy. Um, let me conclude, uh, but not before thanking Michael, again, for teaming up. Second year we do this, uh, big honor. Um, always, you know, when I deal with you, I realize that, you know, I'm only one handshake away of the great Havel. Uh, you're the big guardian of, uh, of his, his thinking. Um, and so it's a pleasure getting to know you and working with you. And equally grateful, of course, to Madam Rector Kalichkova for hosting us here in this wonderful premise and this wonderful university. And I should add one word of thanks for our Tom Doutzenberg, who sort of ties in uh, both our, you know, our both university, University of Leiden and the University of, uh, uh, of uh, the Charles University, and who graduated at this university and was then an intern at our embassy and organized this evening. So I don't know where Tom is. Uh, ah, in the back, there you go, there he is. That's it on my part. Thank you very much. And the word is to Michael. Ah, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, it is a great pleasure and honor to introduce to this lecture. And uh, first of all, I'm very grateful to our partners in this endeavor. Uh, Tom, Dan, Huzinga, uh, Her Magnificence, the Rector, and the Charles University, incidentally, my alma mater as well, uh, for co-organizing this second annual Prague Cleveringa lecture. And let me also thank my team, my colleagues, for helping to prepare this. Last year, we held the event in the Václav Havel Library to commemorate both the brave speech of Rudolf Cleveringa at Leiden University on the 26th of November 1940, protesting the dismissal of his Jewish colleagues by the Nazi occupants, and at the same time, the acceptance speech on the occasion of the 1986 Erasmus of Rotterdam Prize by Václav Havel, emphasizing the importance of civil society and civic values in fighting and defending freedom in fighting for freedom and defending freedom. And I'm particularly thrilled to welcome our speaker this year, who's absent from the room at the moment. <laughs> All right. Professor Luke van Middelaar, a distinguished European historian, political scientist, and political philosopher, and for several reasons, actually. First of all, Professor van Middelaar is one of the foremost authorities today on the current state of the EU and its integration in his capacity, both as a political scientist and author of influential books and articles of which the passage to Europe is perhaps the best known, and a European official in the cabinet of the first permanent president of the European Council, Herman van Rompuy, and as well is in other important posts. Second, on a somewhat more personal note, 
Professor van Middelaar has received his education from the University of Groningen, of which I have fond memories, actually very emotional memories, from the fateful days of the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, when our colleagues in Groningen welcomed us, hosted us, and uh, supported us uh, in a great show of solidarity. And the University of Amsterdam, uh, of which Professor van Middelaar is also uh, a graduate, at which my son is studying today. So, although it is hard to pin down, there seems to be a strong link connecting Czech and Dutch academia and intellectual discourse from Erasmus of Rotterdam to the early European educator Comenius who died in Amsterdam, and his contemporary Baruch Spinoza, all advocates of humanitarian values and critical thinking, to Cleveringa, the Czech philosopher Jan Patočka, and of course, Václav Havel. Third, Professor van Middelaar is a regular visitor to Prague. Actually, he was in town on the 7th of October this year during the summit of the Council of the European Union, when together with two colleagues, he launched the Brussels Institute of Geopolitics in the presence of the top leaders of three important EU member states, Germany, France, and the Netherlands, against the backdrop of Malastrana Baroque beauty. It is a brilliant idea, and I hope that the Institute will flourish and eventually embrace other countries and their foreign policy establishments, including our own, as I fully share the view of its founders that, and I will quote, to preserve its democratic openness on the inside, Europe must strengthen its posture to the outside, practicing Kant at home, and Machiavelli abroad, unquote. Well, we can only hope that we don't get our priorities mixed up and practice Kant on the outside and Machiavelli at home. That would be a mistake. Uh, finally, as to the title of the lecture, to check is Europe after Zeitenwende, may sound a little ominous, but it's still way better than Europe after Goethe Dammerung. So, Professor van Middelaar, Luke, the floor is yours. Good evening, Mrs. Rector. Mr. Ambassador, Excellencies, Mr. Zantowski, dear Michael, thank you for your kind words. Dear colleagues, alumni, students, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to speak here, spend the evening here, and an honor at Charles University, a place filled with history in this very room, with learning, but also with students who want to get going into the future uh, from here until the end of the room. And a very European place as well. Ambassador reminded German Chancellor Schulz reminded his audience this summer, a few rooms away probably uh, from here in what will be remembered as his Prague speech. And I thought it was well chosen of him to set out his views on the future of Europe, not in Paris, the Sorbonne, like Macron, nor in Berlin at home at Humboldt University, another great place of European speeches. The professor remembers it, uh, Joschka Fischer. Nor in Rome or Athens, but here in the heart of Central uh, Europe, in Prague, as a neighborly gesture on behalf of your big neighbor. Uh, but also a sign of the times, of course, so, and which we will discuss, the sign of a Europe, the European Union, moving 
eastward, and then you can even make the Germans move. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is a, is a joint event, as the ambassadors and Michael set out, in which Leiden University and the Havel Library Foundation join forces. Now, on the one hand, that is great, brings more people together, gives synergy, but it also leaves me with the daunting task to honor not just one, but two great moral and political leaders of the 20th century, Klevringa and Václav Havel. And in a way, obviously, uh, on Havel, in, in front of his biographer, and, uh, and here in Prague, I, 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 I would better be brief. Uh, but, of course, we know him all across Europe and in his days in the world as a playwright, a dissident thinker, an author, a political leader of his nation, and then a European statesman as well. And, while preparing today's event and rereading some of Havel's impressive speeches and his vision of Europe, like a speech he gave in Aachen for when he, uh, at the occasion of the Charlemagne Prize or a very important speech to the European Parliament in 1994, I really feel very, in a way, uh, close to that vision of Europe, which was Havel's. And I give one quote from, from that 1994 speech in Strasbourg where your then president said, from time immemorial, Europe, a continent of immense variety and diversity, has had something that can be called an inner order, a specific system of political relations that circumscribed it and somehow tried to institutionalize it. And then he speaks about ancient Rome, Holy Roman Empire, the system of Westphalia, Vienna Congress or Versailles and Yalta, uh, and uh, some of these also harsh moments. But his conclusion is, is important that the idea of the European Union did not fall out of the sky. It was not born just in the laboratory of political engineers or utopians. No, it, in a way it grew quite naturally out of the long centennial, millennial history of our continent, of all these peoples and nations and states living together. And as he also said that here in the Czech lands, huh, that you feel all these spiritual, and these are Havel's words, but spiritual, cultural currents, as well as geopolitical clashes, of course, deeply. This was true uh, when he was in office, as it was true in February, March 1948 or in 1977, and also today. Today also this here Prague, Czech Republic, the Czech lands, are a place of encounter of various forces. But I will stop, better stop here about talking about Prague, eager to learn later in our conversation uh, more about Václav Havel and his vision and, and the way he might have looked at our uh, today's uh, challenges. So perhaps rather also, since I'm here also wearing the, the, the hat, so to say, of, of uh, representative of Leiden University, a few more words also about Professor Claveringa, who has already been briefly been introduced. Um, those from Leiden, he will be familiar. Those from Prague, a bit less. But the story is, is this. The story is one important speech. Huh? At a very specific day, 26th of November 1940, it is more or less, well, we're a week from that, 10 o'clock in the morning, 26th of November 1940. That is to say, in the history of the Netherlands, six months into the Nazi occupation of Holland. Kleveringa, then 46-year-old, father of three, dean of Leiden's law school, walked into a lecture hall awaiting a class on civil law from this professor, Jewish professor, Meyers. And he had to tell the students that Meyers had been dismissed from his post for being Jewish. 
as were many colleagues, others. Now, this, of course, was not the first criminal and inhuman act of the German occupier, but for Cleveringa, now it was enough. And then he turned the lecture, academic lecture he was supposed to give, into a powerful protest. An academic laudatio to a man he considered a mentor and a friend. And he praised him as one of the most distinguished professors of civil law in Europe. And in one of the most famous sentences from that speech, again, 26th of November, 1940, he said of, this, of his colleague, I quote, it is this Dutchman, this noble and true son of our people, this man, this father to students, this scholar, that the foreigner who now dominates us relieves of his function, dismisses. And then final part of the quote, still Claveringa speaking, I told you that I would not speak of my feelings. I will keep my word even though they threaten to burst like boiling lava through all the cracks which I feel at moments could open under the pressure in my head and heart. Cleveringa was indeed arrested the next day. He did survive the war, however, and so did his mentor, Meyers, the Jewish professor, but that is unlike more than 100,000 out of roughly 120,000 Dutch Jewish citizens. After the war, Cleveringa gave four reasons why he spoke out. First, moral duty. He was the dean. It was his role to stand up. Second, moral indignation. Just the sheer fact you, you cannot fire people on the basis of their ethnic origins. That's pure discrimination and against the rule of law. And as a professor of law, he was even more sensitive to that. Third, and of course, in an act of courage, also the personal can come into play. Third, gratitude vis-a-vis -vis his patron, his mentor, his own PhD supervisor, which is maybe a role familiar to some of the students. Fourth, why did he speak out? He wanted to be an example for the students, to not be a coward, but be courageous. And no doubt these four motives, dear Michael, were also dear to the heart of Havel in his role as author, dissident, politician. So these two men, two giants, embodied a clear stance in the face of the historic storms of their time, of the Zeit in Wendes, in a way, of their time, for Cleveringa, holding up a sense of humanity and justice in the face of Nazi crimes. For Havel, well, the same, holding up a sense of humanity and justice in the face of Soviet communism, and then also, in another role, the attempt to help shape the post-Cold War order. And in a way, they both experienced these two of the biggest ruptures of Europe's 20th century, the Second World War, 39-45, and the period right before and after 89, two Zeitenwenders, so, so to say. And when tonight, here, ladies and gentlemen, I propose to speak about Europe after the Zeitenwende of this year, it is also to underline that, again, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February, we are on the middle of a historic moment which asks questions of us and that history is not something for history books alone and for the past, that history is right here, now with us. That is what these events are saying and that is also powerfully what President Volodymyr, Volodymyr sorry, Zelensky has been tirelessly telling all his European audiences since 10 months. He has addressed, some of you may have followed this, almost all single parliament in all European capitals, and everywhere he had the same message addressed to that audience. In Paris, Assemblée Nationale, he would speak about Verdun, about the First World War. In London, he would, of course, speak about Churchill. In the Netherlands, he spoke about the Spanish occupation people even had forgotten about, because it was in the 16th century. But Zelensky reminded them 
history is now. These events are now. And even if you are sitting in Paris, in London, or in The Hague, Ukraine is here. History in the present. Now, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, to see and feel Europe in the Zeitenwende, we can, we can start by asking simply how, how European nations, both individually and jointly as, as a union, have responded to this war, to these horrible events since February. And as some of you who know my work better know, I, at times I have been fairly critical of European action, of Brussels action. I am definitely not among the apologists of anything that comes out of the Berlin building in Brussels. But I would say, but happy to discuss, that in this crisis in this year, the Europeans have shown unity, resolve, and determination. Solidarity with the victim, with Ukraine, help for refugees, humanitarian aid, weapon deliveries, including by the European Union itself, which reinvented itself in that act. The Europe of peace was now uh, helping a victim of a war, and also Ukraine has been helped by granting it the EU candidate status. That is not a bureaucratic box to be ticked, that is a fundamental strategic decision which EU leaders, including Schultz and Macron, we mentioned earlier, and 25 others took in June 2020, momentous. Not only has there been this solidarity with the victim, but also a united will to punish the aggressor, Russia, the Kremlin, Putin, with sanction. And today, even uh, as we speak, 5th of December, is a day of a very concrete action. The Russian oil embargo kicks in, something which has been discussed since late February, March, and which today, at least for seaborne oil, as it's called, kicks in. European firms are also prohibited now from, uh, it's all a bit technical, but from insuring, shipping, or trading Russian crude oil anywhere in the world unless uh, it is sold below a certain price. A lot of financial, economic sanction packages have been taken, coordinated between the EU with the Czech Republic, and of course, an important role this six months as rotating chair, US and UK, decoupling of energy from Russia, the search for alternatives including in Qatar, there's been a lot of football in Qatar as well, but a lot of energy deals in the margins and investments in defense. Taken, I mean, obviously, on all these topics, there's debate, hesitations, uh, strive, different point of view of, of, of interests, clashes, leaks, all the, the, the drama of, of, of media life. Huh? But if you zoom out a little bit, you see a rather united and strong re response, and which is incomparable in any case to what happened in 2014 after the Crimea annexation by Russia. Now, but all of this is still only, let's say, policies, uh, legislative acts, practical measures, energy sanctions, so a bit technical. Important, but technical. But what I find just as interesting also as a topic for our conversation later on is, and perhaps presumably also what two men like Fasha Favel and his colleagues would be more telling and more interesting, what does all of this add to, add up to, in terms of the underlying politics? How, how do the events change our collective sense of the historic moment, our moment in time? How do we live that? And how do, do they shape and, and change the form of our continent? Uh, a bit more abstract questions. So I'll, I'll take these two points. First, the mental change of where we are in time. And I think there, and maybe if maybe some had seen in coming, we'll come to that, but this 2022 is a year of a true wake-up call. It dawns today on many more people than one year ago, that we in Europe 
You can look at the difference later, but let's say we in Europe, we are entering a more dangerous world, a more hostile world, a geopolitical world. In a way, for me, that is also what Zeitung when the means or, or how it should be interpreted. It is, so to say, the end of some of the dreams of 1989, of that generation. It is the end of the end of history. And we do not find back the world from before 1989, but we are in a new world new era, which we are discovering, which is unexplored. Now, of course, we can say this latest events, and this year in particular, they have not been a surprise to everybody, and for some in, in Warsaw or, or Tallinn, or, or no doubt also here in Prague, the Russian invasion with all its horror also felt like, well, uh, a moment of, I told you so, or we told you so, speaking from here to, to, to Berlin, to Paris, to Hague. Perhaps a moment of revendication. And it clearly is a, a balancing moment of, of these various experiences between East and Central and, and, and Western Europe of ours, our place in, in, in space. And this is fully understandable. At the same time, I think it's also important to keep in mind that there was no, perhaps, necessity in this, that history is open. It, yes, some things can be predicted, or we should have known better or more in advance, but you can always have surprises. Huh? History is not written in advance. And even for Russia under Putin, at least in early days, there have been forks in the road roads not taken, and roads taken, bringing us here, in this interplay of maybe necessity and long-term raison d'etat and free choice. And history, in that respect, is the domain of human freedom, as, as Hannah Arendt would say it, somebody who read a lot of Patochka, and that's as well. Now, of course, this, this strategic wake-up moment of the Russian threat, it follows a whole series of, of shocks, but it is adding to a whole other series of experiences. I think very important is the Donald Trump election in 2016. We tend to look at it almost now as something in the past, but I would say that that election has made the transatlantic fairy tale more problematic. It was, we, we lived happily as transatlantic community since 1945 and since 1989, more or less in the case here of Central and Eastern Europe. And in a way, something is, the spell has been broken by Trump. And we want to believe that we can still be, find back that old, pre-world, but it, pre-2016 world, but it is difficult. But this is not, of course, not just Trump and what's happening in the United States. More importantly, what's happening in China. Uh, it's assertive inroads into Europe. Uh, it's economy, mass diplomacy during the pandemic. Regional strongmen like Erdogan, leader of Turkey, flexing their muscles, weaponizing migration to put pressure on the EU. Something the ambassador has, has dealt with is some, some some previous jobs. So all of this comes together in this, in this much more existential shock of war and peace on the continent, a land war close to us, close to your borders and close to all our borders. Because what is happening today in Ukraine is also experienced by people as far away as Portugal and Spain as something which is relevant to them which is not just far away, as maybe they looked at it 10 or 15 years ago, but which is part of a shared European experience. And that is, that is new. And we, we should hope and work to draw, therefore, also strength from that wake-up call, from that experience of our vulnerability, if I may say so, of our mortality even. Alongside this 
strategic wake-up moment, this mental change. There is, what I also find interesting is that the, the European continent, huh, the European state system is reorganizing itself. And it starts with the place Russia occupies, or no longer occupies. Russia is moving eastward, clearly. And um, one reason all European nations, and as I said, all the way to Portugal, and they are safely behind the Pyrenees, right? So they don't fear uh, the Russian army the way you can in the lower lands uh, between Moscow and Berlin. So e even they, they, they feel that Ukraine, um, they share the common, let's say, implicit understanding that Russian imperialism should be stopped. And that Russia should allow us, if you allow me the analogy, that a decolonization in a way of, of the Ukrainian nation from the Russian Empire, just as the Baltic states and others succeeded. Now zooming out and, and, and speaking as an historian, geographically the, the trend is pretty, pretty clear since two centuries. Uh, I've lived a few years in Paris and after the defeat of Napoleon, in the Battle of Waterloo, 1815, the Russian army stood in Paris. After the defeat of Hitler, 45, the Red Army stood in Berlin, you know, in these pictures with these soldiers and flags, and in Prague, as we know, in Budapest. Today, with the retreat from Kherson a few weeks ago, Russians have been pushed back again beyond the Dnieper. So, taking a long view, there's a clear eastward movement and as a result of political choices, free choices too, as I said, Russia is becoming less of a European and more of a Eurasian nation. That's a big change. The second change I would say in our continental order is that the borders are hardening. We have harder borders, a hard border now between Russia and the rest of Europe. There is no space anymore for in-betweenness. For a long time, especially after this 1989 moment of, of the happy globalization, Fukuyama, end of history, it seemed as if Russia and the EU were destined almost to move closer to each other under a common set of rules, international. And for the countries wedged in, in between, like Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and Belarus, of course, it meant that life would never be comfortable, but that all-out war and hard binary choices could still be skirted for a long time. But however, with the war, with 24th of February, this possibility of an in-between existence has gone. And it's clear that a new geopolitical dividing line cuts across our continent. And now the question is, on what side of this line Ukraine and other in-between countries will find themselves? And here, strategically, European nations, the Czech Republic and its neighbors and all others have offered two perspectives. One is that EU membership perspective, which we already mentioned. It is one way of saying they belong to us. You belong to us, to our side of this hard border. But that was not all. It was a second way to make that same point differently, more immediately, because EU membership may take 10, 15 years. It's been a more immediate message to say you belong here, and that has been engineered here in Prague two months ago, very visibly, powerfully, and I'm referring, of course, to that first summit of the European political community, of the overall European family at Prague Castle. And, and, and comment, some commentators said beforehand, well, why are they meeting all these leaders? It's, it's, it's useless, they have nothing, uh, no practical results, it's just a photo. Well, if you reason like that, then, then you do not understand the importance of photos, the importance of politics, the importance of symbols in politics, in continental politics as well. The family photo is the message in that case, and it was saying to Putin that 
the whole European continent, not just the EU27, but also Liz Truss for the few weeks that she was in office. She managed to visit Prague Castle. Uh, but also Erdogan, somewhat ambiguously. Also the Prime Ministers of Norway and Switzerland, very happy to be here, usually outside the EU, but very happy. Uh, and, and, and others were all present here in Prague, standing united, and saying to two absentees, Putin and Lukashenko, that we are one family. I thought, in a way, for me, that was the most important, impressive, and lasting success of the Czech uh, Council presidency, or in, in any case, related to the role the Czech Republic has played these six months. Now, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, of course, this story is ongoing. War is ongoing. Winter is ahead. Russia is using General Frost. The threat of nuclear escalation is still with us. And I, I suspect we can, will discuss much of this in our conversation. Or over dinner. But when speaking tonight, let's say, under the guidance of Cleveringa and, and Havel, I almost feel obliged to also take one further step back. And it's to also uh, to think about them and to ask, okay, faced with these events, these historic shocks, all this turmoil and horror, what kind of attitude, what kind of moral attitude do today's events ask from us? And I would like, for the sake of our debate, value dear to the heart of Havel also, I would like to avoid the apparently easiest answer. And what would that easy or seemingly easy answer be? That, that could be, well, as a result of Zeitung, when not, as a result of what we see now, as a result of our past mistakes with Putin and Gazprom and all these stories, we should now disengage from all nations not sharing our values. That is the conclusion we should draw. And to some extent, looking at your big neighbor, that is part of the debate in Germany, but also in, in, in the United States. But Germany is interesting because it is the heart of Europe and it is a country of mood swings. Huh? We've seen that with nuclear energy and I've seen it also with other shocks. Uh, when there's a great shock, the Stimmung kippt as they say, the, the mood goes from one extreme to the other. And today in Berlin, the fear is that they don't want to repay the, repeat the Gazprom mistake. And I, f I fully understand, clearly. But as a result, you could say that after decades of denying the security implications of Germany's energy relationship with Russia, as I said, now the road to greater security seems to lie in severing all economic and diplomatic ties with powers that do not share our liberal and democratic values, such as Russia and China. And then those powers are also increasingly portrayed as the enemy, as evil states we should not even try to reason with, to shut down with. And there the question is, well, it's an open question, but it's an important question for us in the months and years ahead. Is this how we should look at our place in the world? Is this the conclusion we should draw, is it even possible? And it, it, it strikes me that it is difficult to address the strategic choices at the heart of how we should behave in our era on the basis of a language of values alone. They, they can guide it and they should guide us, but they can, can guide us only so far. Because some of these strategic choices require of us to talk also the language of interests. And in, uh, I cannot here speak for the Czech Republic, but I know in Brussels it is forbidden to speak about interests. It's a dirty word. It's forbidden to speak about power as well. In Germany as well, it's forbidden to speak about interests. Of course, we outsiders, uh, we see that the Germans pursue their interests, but they do not talk about it. So that leads to hypocrisy and all kinds of things. 
but of the fact that there's no debate, that there's a certain discomfort to address that, um, has other drawbacks, more serious than the risk of hypocrisy. I would mention two, and both are more important, getting sharper in the age of great power conflict. The first disadvantage when you, again, only rely on values is what I would call strategic myopia. Pursuing a values-based foreign policy is, again, laudable in itself, but when it's not underpinned by hard-headed awareness of the public national interest, raison d'etat, it will suffer from blind spots. You cannot see everything. You will be unable to detect all the vital nuances that, for, may, may example, that for example, may at times pull Europe and the United States in different strategic directions. Europe and the US since 1945 share our fundamental democratic and liberal values. Very clear, very important. And clear to both Havel and Cleveringa, of course. But we do not always, with Europe and the US, share the same economic, territorial, and security interests. And looking at the United States, and perhaps also looking at Europe, but looking at the United States, this gap is even likely to widen. And I know it's delicate in the current war context, but as long as this interest gap cannot be calmly analyzed or even acknowledged, we in Europe will be underprepared and hapless when the US, as may happen again, or happens to some extent now, decides to play against us. Sanctions against law-breaking Russia, however right and necessary, have not hit us here in Europe and the US economies in the same manner. Massive energy subsidies made available by the Biden administration aggravate this. They are hoovering up investment for Europe. And that will hit prosperity and jobs on our side of the Atlantic. So not to mention we are now buying LNG from Qatar and the US. Or take the example of Africa, which is for the United States just one battleground in the overall great power game with China, but for us in Europe it is a close neighbor destined to count maybe three to four billion people at the end of the century and whose economic development is highly relevant for us to think about migration. So yeah, proximity, geography also matter and we, we should not forget that. But the second point is more important, maybe a little bit more philosophical. And that is that whereas the moral language of values and human rights so important to us, to our pride and self-image, rightly. That also puts us on the pressure never to make compromises. Interests are more negotiable, pluralistic. And these qualities will also be needed in the Zeitenwende. And that's not an easy message, so I apologize, but hard times will compel us to make also hard political trade-offs. Take our relationship with China, which is very much in the news these days. Clearly, we should avoid being strategically over-dependent on China's economic power. Reading the news this morning, I saw that a number of MEPs, members of the European Parliament, are protesting against China or a Chinese firm being given a big public tender on who should inspect our ports, European ports. Uh, uh, because all, then otherwise all the data would end up in China. So clearly these are risks and we have been much too naive for these kind of things. But on undoing all economic links abruptly, this decoupling, as some advocate, would cause, I would think, immediate and economic and social hardship in Europe. So it would hurt other values in a way, social justice, equality. Not to forget that we would Beijing also to keep putting pressure on Putin in Moscow to show nuclear restraint in Ukraine. So this is just complicated, right? All these crucial ends require staying on speaking terms with an illiberal 
leader like Xi Jinping, a balancing act. And I, I, I'd be very curious to hear from, from the biographer how, how Václav Havel would, has or would have dealt with these kinds of moral choices and dilemmas. Um, again, look at the World Cup. Some Western European nations, the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, England, Wales, Wales uh, the Danes, all Protestant nations except for Belgium, by the way, but that's a detail. Uh, they felt uneasy about attending these matches, the World Cup. But at the same time, uh, German Green Minister for Energy is also sealing a massive 15 year long deal on LNG deliveries. So, very painful dilemma. But that's how it is in political life as in personal life. We cannot have it all. We cannot have and security and freedoms and human rights and prosperity and social justice and peace. And I would say, and that's the philosophical point, that this is not just a matter of saying, well, this is realpolitik, huh? complicated, only downplaying moral considerations in the name of other goals. No, I would say, go one step further, as the philosopher Isaiah Berlin, a man born in Riga, argued, we are confronted as human beings with the plurality of values plurality of values, and we cannot subsume these values under one overriding principle. Which should it be? Freedom or equality? Liberté ou égalité? Uh, that's two centuries of French history about that question. Upholding human rights or avoiding nuclear Armageddon? Which should it be? Which is more important if you have to choose? And I think the need to make such choices is something which political leaders must articulate much more openly with the voters. The, and the public needs to know, and in a way knows already, maybe better than some of the leaders, that we cannot have it all and that choices will have to be made. And I would argue that this is a sign of moral maturity and that it is quintessentially European to recognize the limits of what we can achieve and the plurality of our highest values and then strive for them. And this plurality, apologies, this plurality, the fact that human beings can be torn between conflicting ends in a way, here Michael also lies at the heart almost of European culture, of, of literature, of theater, right? going all the way back to ancient Greece. Think of Antigone by Sophocles, torn between the will, the wish to bury her brother against the laws of the city, and there are many, many other examples, which is no doubt both the playwright from Prague and the dean of the law faculty juggling Claveringa with various conflicting ends would be familiar with. And it is from that realization, I think, that part of their moral courage and practical wisdom has sprung. Now let me conclude here, because I've, I've spoken already for too long, that to, to say that as a result of this strategic wake-up call, the, the, the way we are reorganizing our continent, the fact that we realize, and again this World Cup in Qatar is a magnificent example, we Europeans no longer have the same place in the world and we have to face with choices. That should be a collective endeavor of all European states, EU member states. All should be part about the conversation to make Europe, often with the United States, not always more strategic and more united. And Havel, in, 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 in that same speech at the European Parliament, he also said, very rightly so, that what happens in one country in Europe always resonates elsewhere. It resonates with the neighbors, culturally, spiritually, but also politically. We are now, it strikes me also as a political analyst, we are watching much more intently than 10, 15 years ago, which is nothing for a historian. 
watching much more intently elections at our neighbors uh, and in the whole of Europe this year uh, in Italy and Sweden. So in that respect, also your elections uh, in January will be watched all across the region and all across the European Union for what they tell about the response of the Czech voters and the Czech Republic to this uh, Zeitenwende and the will to make some of these choices together. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation, to your questions, and thank you for your kind attention. It was an honor to speak here in front of you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Van Medelaar. Thank you, Luke. Uh, I think you gave us more food for thought than we'll be able to digest in the time that remains. Uh, what's going to happen now? We're going to have a conversation for uh, a few minutes and uh, then at about half past six uh, it will be over to you, uh, our uh, uh, audience, uh, to ask questions and to uh, make comments and we should uh, wrap up by seven o'clock, roughly. Uh, now, look, I mean, tonight is uh, what we call the St. Nicholas night and uh, when we will walk out of here, you will see a lot of people dressed up as devils and, uh, and uh, also angels and, uh, and uh, St. Nicholas's. Uh, but uh, so this is a, an opportunity, opportunity for me to play a devil's advocate. And uh, I will try to do so to make the conversation more uh, dynamic. Uh, and uh, there are, you know, several things I, I, I'd like to discuss. The first one is, you mentioned it in the beginning of uh, your talk, how things have changed over the past 12 months and but also how the language has changed with it. I mean, uh, there are some old new concepts that uh, we are uh, reviving and geopolitics is uh, 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 the, perhaps the most important of them, geopolitics is back. And uh, with it is the concept of geopolitics and not for nothing it is called it resembles in its name a science like geophysics, you know, because it deals with uh, with force fields of uh, of uh, politics and geography and history and ideology and and religion and the various forces and the interaction leads to outcomes in in the in the geopolitical world. So. Uh, and, uh, and because of this, because the forces clash and compete, it's uh, inevitably an adversarial discipline. I mean, there are competitors and enemies and uh, other not very nice creatures in the realm of geopolitics and for a long time and i think you hinted at that we expel them out of uh, the language of european integration and uh, and pretended that uh, uh, that they don't exist and uh, as it has been famously said i mean the biggest achievement of 
the devil was to make people believe that he doesn't exist. And, uh, and now it is back in, in some uh, capacity. At the same time, some of the things that we've had, uh, for my taste, all too often uh, before uh, last February, uh, are slowly disappearing from the discourse, you know, strategic autonomy, you know. Uh, it's such a nice sounding concept and, uh, and, uh, and there may be, you know, many essays written about it, but in the world of geopolitics, which is the real world, you know, if you look at a map of Europe, uh, you will see a rather small promontory at the tip of a giant uh, Euro-Asian continent. And uh, in any discussion of European security, uh, you have to take that into account. I mean, the Atlantic is uh, European strategic depth, and the natural ally, and this was the case for the last century, is the big country at the other end of the pond. And, and even more so, you know, even now, you know, there's a dirty word in uh, European discourse that's rarely mentioned. And the word is the United Kingdom. You know, it's many people would like to pretend that uh, uh, Britain has sunk in the ocean and it's no longer there, but it's very much still there, and it's uh, actually the strongest European military power uh, in, the, in the west of Europe. So again, this should, be, uh, this should be taken into account. So my, my first question you know, to you is how do we revise and rearrange our conceptual mm -hmm. uh, world to account for the developments on the ground. And on to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for uh, taking the discussion to, to its, its core. I think there are two points, basically. In what, first is, how do I look at the idea of geopolitics. What does it mean? How, how should we see it? I think if you look at when we did not have a geopolitical lens at the world, it was a more universal lens. And there you said, rightly, I, I like the expression, we expelled all the others from that lens. People who were not like us, they were heretics, they were fools, they were stupid, but they, they were not in a way full, fully rational uh, actors. Whereas in a world of geopolitics and power, you take them seriously at, as adversaries. So that, that is a, a real distinction. And, and it may have gone even, sorry to interrupt, please. even even a little further because, you know, we even pretended because it's the best way to deal with it that they're not human, that they are uh, forces out of the human world like Ebola or, you know, climate change or, of course, we know now that climate change is human. Uh, Islam. made in 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 in, in 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 large part but it's uh, you know so much easier to uh, or or covid you know it's uh, 
it's a virus, you know, nobody's responsible for the virus, not even uh, in China, nobody's uh, responsible for it. So it makes us feel... Uh, more powerful. In more powerful, more easy, more uh, and we don't have to blame anyone. You know, you blame virus doesn't make sense. No, I, I, I agree that you could go further with that, but going back to geopolitics, I think we talked a lot about power, but geopolitics is not only about power. That is just one of the elements of geopolitics, I would say, one of three. Uh, uh, geopolitical action is thinking also in terms of power and not only ideas or the law. The second is, is territory. It's the geo. Uh, it's geography. And that is also something which, again, I'm speaking here also, let's say, from Brussels, which was not part of the Brussels way of thinking. Uh, borders, territory, the EU was about tearing down borders, Europe without borders, internally, and not thinking about the outside world and whether there would be a difference of being a neighbor of Russia or of Switzerland. Uh, it's a big difference. It, difference of territory, but also, thirdly, it's the element of collective identity or, 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 or narrative, which also comes in with geopolitics, the idea that, okay, we live on a world with various powers on their territories, but some, the, the strongest geopolitical actors, Chinese presidents, Russian presidents, American presidents as well, they also have a story about who they are and to whom they speak about. And that's also a weakness in the case of Europe, at least for us Europeans mm -hmm. collectively. Uh, as Havel said it a few times so beautifully, because we're always torn between this unity and diversity. So, so that's why this geopolitical angle is so difficult, but it's also imposing itself now in this moment, as you, as you say. I understand your irony about strategic autonomy. Huh? It is um, if the idea is that we should be able, as Europeans, to stand up for ourselves, it cannot be true tomorrow or the day after tomorrow militarily. So if we pretend that it can, that would be irresponsible. And I think that is some of the irritations, let's say, some here in Central and Eastern Europe have had with some more lofty ambitions coming from the Elysee or the, or the Quai d'Orsay in, in, in Paris. The Atlantic is the final point. The Atlantic, that is there, that's indeed territorial reasoning when you say the Atlantic uh, is our European strategic depth. Yeah. I like the formula. But that does not only depend on us, and that's, that's the trouble. It also depends on the Atlantic power, United States of America, which, as we know, is turning more into a Pacific power as well, it's turning its gaze towards China and Asia, and where does that leave us? Knowing huh, that the smaller Atlantic power, the UK, has left our club, huh, has not left the European continent, and is part, as I mentioned, Liz Truss, she came here, it was very important that she was there, very, very important that she came, or, uh -huh. to show that the Brits are still in the European family, but they're no longer in our club. So that has indeed some significant consequences, which have been underestimated, in my view, and which weaken us collectively. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, of course, the very fact of the Brexit, and uh, I you know, belong to, I'm a psychologist by training, so I belong to the school who believes that it always takes two for a divorce and uh, that for all the blunders the British have made and I was the ambassador in London for you know most of that period of the run-up to uh, to the referendum on Brexit uh, there have been mistakes done on on our part as well and uh, and now I think in the face of the Russian aggression, you know, the priority should be to try to restore some of that relationship, at least in the security uh, area and and defense area, and uh, and because uh, 
in the end it may be more it may affect our future more than the Northern Ireland Protocol. And uh, uh, so, uh, I, I, look, I mean, if, if I'm ironic, forgive me, because I'm, I'm that way. But when, when, I, when I say that about the strategic autonomy, it doesn't mean I don't think that we should be building more independent... Uh, uh, defense and security uh, means to counter the threats that we should not build more muscle and that we shouldn't be more able to to act independently if if need be uh, i'm just it's you know the fact that in the end our best chance may be the alliance that uh, served us in good stead for a long time is no excuse for not doing anything on, on our own, I, I, I confess that. And, uh, and it's true that there may be developing an interest gap on, on both sides of the Atlantic uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, strategic threats and risks and, and responding uh, to them, but at the same time, I'm a little cynical about that too, because I, I, I was ambassador to Washington in the early 90s when the first Clinton administration uh, uh, came in and the talk in terms of it's the economy stupid was about, you know, turning to Asia and developing uh, uh, relationships there and the more robust uh, uh, relationship with, I, with Asia, okay, okay. Uh, what, 15 years later, uh, we had the pivot to Asia under Obama administration. Okay, well, there, it was not all that much of a pivot, but, you know, more attention has been paid to to Asia, and then, then you have Trump and and Biden, and they, on this, on Asia, they've been saying some of the similar things. But uh, on the ground, you know, it's uh, it remains to to see the results. And now on Trump himself, you know, I I will confess, I detest the man. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I think we all too often we taking him for an excuse, you know, uh, not to think uh, in more depth about the value of the Euro-American relationship. And again, as I'm becoming an old man, you know, we've been there before. I mean. Reagan administration was a, a, a big time for anti-American uh, demonstrations uh, uh, around Europe. Bush, the younger, was another American president we loved to hate, and etc., uh, etc. Et and uh, and Trump is, you know, an extreme case because I recognize. I think he's been a threat to American constitution and the American institutions, and he challenged uh, uh, the democratic institutions in the United States. But I think we're missing sometimes the important thing that in the conflict between him and the constitution, he's lost at least so far. I mean, the the, the system has won. And, and it's the system we allied with, we, we depended upon in a, and every ambassador to Washington knows that he has to follow both sides of the aisle. He has to follow bipartisan policy mm -hmm. or he will not get anywhere. And, and 
I, I pray and hope that you know eventually we'll get back to, uh, to, 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 to that perspective because I think it serves the United States and it serves, uh, serves us as, uh, as well. But now, let's move on to Ukraine because, uh, yes, uh, uh, this, uh, there was much to be proud of, there has been much to be proud of and encouraged about the European reaction to, to the aggression in Ukraine. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm proud as well, but uh, it should not obscure the fact that some of it came quite late in the day. Yeah, and it should not obscure the fact which is even more important that uh, we haven't quite won yet. Ukraine haven't quite won yet. And there are two obvious problems we're facing. And one is how do we get through the winter? Uh, the war has entered an attrition phase and you can hear voices in this country as well as in all other countries, you know, maybe we've, uh, uh, we've uh, given enough and helped enough and now, you know, our own people are freezing and, uh, uh, you know, maybe we should uh, 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 think about uh, our people first uh, mm -hmm. and in the run up to the presidential election here, you can hear it loud, loud and clear. So uh, how do we overcome the, the fatigue that inevitably is uh, uh, setting in? And the second, and I can offer some answers to the first question, but I, I am not, I don't know the answers for the second, is uh, the end game, you know. It's, uh, uh, there are obvious though muted differences of opinion among Europeans on how the end the game should look like, what the end uh, state of this uh, conflict uh, uh, should be. And uh, some of the questions there are uh, geopolitical questions, some of them are legal questions, and some of them are moral questions. Uh, help me with that. Thank you. Um, these are, yeah, it's a set of big questions, and before turning to Ukraine, and then no doubt also to the room at some point, maybe it's also nice to slightly disagree on, on some things. Uh, including the, the, the role, or let's say the future of, of, of the United States in that relationship. In a way, I wish that you are right, of course. I wish that you are right and that we will live happily ever for after. But I do think, looking at the United States, that there is not just as easy to say, well, we've had the Vietnam War, we didn't like the American presidents then, we have had the Iraq War, and now we have the Inflation Reduction Act or whatever, and there's always a reason to, to not like the Americans. I think there are underlying trends, demographic trends. Um, America being less interested in Europe, uh, going from the East Coast also economically, South and West to California, um, the, let's say, the, the average American is like a 38-year man, and he, he has not lived these great transatlantic moments of the landing in Normandy, the fall of the Berlin Wall. He is probably of Latin American origin or Asian, and so there, there is the factor of demography. But also there is the China factor. And whereas, as long as Russia was America's, and that brings us also to Ukraine, obviously, as long as Russia was America's principal geostrategic rival at the, at the Soviet Union, the global stage, we were lucky as Europeans, West Europeans, and ultimately also all Europeans in between, 
because by helping us, it was at the same time an act of imperial generosity and towards us and of imperial adversity towards Russia, the rival. With China, it's not like that because it's on the other side of the globe and um, it's a big difference in the way the United States look at us. And there's also, again, the factors of demography and the economy. Uh, in 1945, in the, uh, you know, when after the Second World War, uh, the Americans came forward with the Marshall Plan and, and the fact that Stalin did not allow you and others to participate, of course, triggered in a way also the realization of the Cold War back in 47, 8. At that time, the United States represented more than 50% of global wealth. So they could afford to help their friends and allies withstand the, uh, its geostrategic adversary. No longer today. Uh, the, the margins for American political largesse, electoral margins as well, uh, so are much smaller. It's one sef seventh more or less of global. Mm -hmm. wealth. And the rest of the world, uh, a few weeks ago we celebrated baby number 8 billion. Hmm? That's all Asia, half, more than half. Celebrated? No, the United Nations <laughs> celebrated and they, they picked some random baby and they gave the mother uh, some flowers, I guess, and the father a car, I don't know what they did. Okay. Uh, and saying, well, now we are officially 8 billion on this planet. Fantastic. Four point something of them are in Asia and we in Europe is, you know, like less than a billion, same in the US, so we are shrinking. And, and, and there's also that dimension, I think, of global power relations, which we in Europe, and I, I myself as well, I try to educate myself, but we tend to underestimate because we think where we sit is the center of the world. Yeah. And we have just two meters difference, but uh, yeah. we are both the center of the world. So, so that's on just by my and uh, my, my, my little nuance on... on my, my last word on that, you, you're absolutely right. And, uh, and uh, 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 there's the demographic factor and uh, the economic factor will uh, certainly play out. My argument is, and that holds for the conflict with China or for the relationship to China, it doesn't have necessarily to be a conflict as well, is that... We, by the same token that we are, that the United States are our strategic depth, we are the strategic depth for the United Nation, for the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, among the concepts that you know come back into fashion, at least in my mind, is the concept of the West. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, uh, and you know. Benjamin Franklin, who was the American ambassador to Europe at the time of the American Revolution, you know, uh, famously uh, said that we will all hang together or we will hang each one alone. So, uh, and, you know, in the geopolitical think thinking, it may come down to that. I'm not sure that it will, but now Ukraine and then to the audience? Well, I mean, of course, Ukraine, uh, these questions are too big for, for this uh, small room. But your first, let's say, more practical question, how do we get through the winters, through this winter and also the next winter? Uh, I think there has so far been more resilience and, 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 and unity on the side of the European public at large than was expected. I agree. People have been ready, prepared to turn the heat down with a few degrees. Uh, which, so they, this links back to what I uh, said earlier, people are not crazy. They know there are certain choices uh, to, to be made. And as long as the sentiment is that Europe is sorry, that Ukraine is a European nation just like us here, as the Czechs or as the Belgians or the Swedes, uh, fighting for its uh, democratic freedoms against a, an imperial master, to put it that way, 
then we, we, we will, I think, collectively also uh, be able to continue uh, supporting Ukraine. In a way, paradoxically, when the war ends, it may even become more difficult because when the war ends, uh, it, the situation is no longer dramatic, but then the real bills come, the invoices, the reconstruction. Those yeah? come due, yeah. Uh, weapons are cheaper than building apartments, even if weapons are very ex expensive uh, too. So, so there are definitely um, clear questions ahead. On the end game, I, 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 let me just make two points. Uh, one I already made, it is important that whatever that end game is, that it is clear and secure that Ukraine as a country is on our side of that new dividing line and should be protected accordingly. Uh, is that as member of the European Union, is that enough question mark to northern nations, Finland and Sweden have looked at the situation and judged that it was not enough to be only in the EU and they knocked at the door of NATO, as you know, which they hope to enter uh, by circumventing some Turkish blackmail in the weeks and months ahead. But, so will it be enough for Ukraine to be only in the EU and not in NATO to be safe on this side of the new hard continental border? Probably not. So what does that mean? That's an open question, but something which so far also uh, the American president uh, has uh, not been uh, willing to discuss. That's fair enough. Um, the second point on the end game is, of course, it was humiliating for Europe collectively that one year ago, December 21, when Putin did one of his over, uh, ouverture, what's it called, the openings towards uh, some diplomatic talks, maybe, fa maybe fake, never mind, but it was clear that the only person he wanted to speak to is the US President, Biden. Hmm? And that in the arrangement of the future place of, of Ukraine on the European continent, in the mind of, of, of Putin, I don't know about Biden, but it's just a matter for them too. And, uh, and that is also, by the way, a reason why you can rightly be ironic about strategic autonomy, but I also think that it is not a sound, uh, healthy situation, uh, as it were, that these vital strategic issues are dealt with to some extent over our heads. On this optimistic note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll switch to the room. Thank you, Luke. And uh, questions? Professor Rovna is the Dean of European Studies in, at this university, so she has the right to ask the first question. Uh, Thank you very much. I am a Chair Emeritus. <laughs> and former vice rector. The dean in the real sense of the word. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Luke, for your very interesting speech. Uh, I would like to ask you, and this is what Michael was present at, and this was a speech of Václav Havel at American Congress. Uh, and he spoke, or he said, that if you want to help us, help Russia. And when you spoke about Ukraine and about the hard border, so what will happen to Russia? Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, what, what will happen to Russia that will depend on Russia? That is a sad story indeed. Huh? I absolutely uh, agree because in my mind, and I know some people have now stopped reading Tolstoy, uh, but that, I think, is, is horrible, it makes me cry. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, Russian uh, 
great novelists, uh, music, uh, the, the architecture of St. Petersburg. Uh, uh, that is also part of our common, uh, common civilizational space as, as Europeans of, of, of which uh, Russia for a few centuries clearly wanted to, to be uh, a part. And so that is really, let's say, when I describe this hard border, it is with pain in my heart. And I'm, I'm in, late to the cause, I would say. Uh, um, but I think in the current situation and with the current leadership, it, it, it is a, a, a strategic approach which, which uh, we are obliged, obliged to do to defend ourselves against uh, threats not only of a military uh, nature but also in um, cyber warfare and all these kind of things where um, migration has been used as well by put in to de destabilize our societies and democracies. That, so it's clear that we have to protect ourselves. So how today can we help the Russians without endangering those whom we help because they would be in touch with foreign agents in a regime which is in an ever more nationalistic frenzy. That is, that is not so easy and it is that's why I said that these choices are, are so heartbreaking, some of them, right? because it is also saying farewell to some of these post-1989 uh, hopes. I would not say dreams, because they, they were possible. Right? That is important to keep in mind. Right? So I do not think we should say, well, we've always been naive. Or... No, these were hopes, but we have to now look at the facts, the ground, and they have not been uh, fulfilled. So we can we can pray, but we 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 we, we maybe should not. Hmm. Um, well, let me stop there. <laughs> well, let me put this in to context. I mean, this famous quote that Professor Rovna used by Václav Havel in the American Congress is these days is taken by some people to argue that because we did not help Russia on its way to democracy, we didn't do our homework, then, you know, look what yeah, we... But, sorry, look, let, let me interrupt look, you look for once. That's, that's like saying, well, building the classless society, we did not enough. And yeah. there's still one Absolutely. more step to go. It's the same... And I think there's a body of empirical evidence to, to prove that actually collectively the west we bent over backwards to to help russia it's not saying we didn't make mistakes but in trying to help the russians build the institutions of a democratic government to secure its nuclear weapons to help is with economic know-how to remove all the sanctions on exports on sensitive material you know we did more than, uh, than they could have, as a party, I'm sorry to say, that lost the Cold War, they could have, they could have expected. And, and uh, the truth is that, yes, they are now a corrupt regime, mafia, of mafia capitalism, robbed blind, but the people who did that were Russians. You know, if you look at the oligarchs, at the, at the, people in charge, they, they all Russian. So I'm, I'm not buying this argument that the question is when Russia, and I, I, I still believe that it will happen, when Russia loses the war, of course, it will be another new situation in which we will be asked to help and should help. You know, I'm not saying we shouldn't. But I think we will have to be, this time around, we will be, have to be more hard-nosed and hard-headed uh, about it and, uh, and really require conditionality on, on many of the things we will do for Russians. In, 
and of course they would hate the comparison if they had me, they don't listen to me. Uh, in the same way, we were helping the Germans and the Japanese after the Second World War. Please. Hi, uh, my name is Enzo. I'm a first year student in the EPS program here at the Charles University. Uh, thank you for your thoughtful discussions. Um, earlier, Mr. Jantowski, you were saying that uh, geopolitics is back. Um, for me, I f um, so I'm, I'm from the US. Um, as an American, uh, we're looking at She's China or uh, Putin's Russia, and looking at the countries who border Russia, like the Baltic states, Ukraine, Poland, it doesn't really feel like geopolitics ever left. So wouldn't it be more accurate to say that geopolitics for the EU is, is back? And then concerning the Zeitenwende, um, why, why this year, why 2022, why not? like 2008 with the Russian in, uh, war in Georgia, or like 2014 with the um, annexation of Crimea and the war in the Dom Donbass region in, in Ukraine since then. You want to start? Well, yeah, I, 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 these are good questions, fair points, and also interesting, I think, revealing in itself that from the point of view of an American, and. Uh, there has always been geopolitics or, or power politics, and it has not been a way. So we're talking, I think, more indeed about a European experience, both about the return of the need for the language to, to speak and think and act in terms of geopolitics, power, strategy, interests, which in the kind of blessed situation after 1945, under American protection, we could nicely and innocently forget about and pretend that what we Europeans first in Western Europe, then in the whole of Europe, build as a rule-based internal order, that is the Kant world you refer to from our mission statement, that it was not a power that there was, in a way, a power underpinning it, which was U.S. power. We, we, we prefer to forget this. Um, and, of course, in the United States, you and your leaders and diplomats have not forget, forgotten this, rightly so. So I think, so it's a return of the narrative, for one thing, and second, it is the fact of, of a brutal war, a land war, and, and, and not... In my experience, uh, the same skill of, of violence and, and horror as what we have seen also in 2008 was, well, I wouldn't say skirmishes, but we're not talking about a massive uh, invasion. And then to the extent there was the Russians were stopped. There was, uh, and in 20, well, let's, uh, 14, again, yes, Tens of thousands of people died already in Donbass, but it it did not apparently uh, go through a certain threshold of the uh, overall European experience of this is a war, which was easy to understand for any European citizen, again, wherever, opening the radio uh, on, on Thursday morning, 24th of February. Whereas when we're talking about Crimea, you had all legal experts and international law and this and that, it was complicated and Khrushchev. And so it was not a, a five second thing. And the invasion was prima facie wrong. Everybody understood it and a war so close by. So that's, a, and of, you could say, in circles of experts, we, we knew it, and we have discussed the various experiences between Western and, and Central and Europe, Eastern Europe. But let's say then for Western Europe, this this it needed clearly to get this bad to to come to the level of full public awareness of what is happening, building on 
as I said in uh, in the talk, China 2014 as well, uh, Trump migration. But it's a moment of crystallization. Uh, it's uh, you know you you did mention earlier Luke, that uh, there may be some feeling we've told you so around mm -hmm. these parts of Europe and. Believe me, there's no, no schadenfreude at all. It's uh, just maybe a little regret, but, uh, 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 but the thing is that history often, almost always, only makes sense in retrospect. You know, going forward, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to read where, where it is going, but it's, it should not be our excuse for willful ignorance of, uh, of signals. And uh, if we go back not to 2008, to 2004, to the Munich conference uh, mm -hmm. where Putin spoke, uh, he made it absolutely clear that he was, you know, going to try to uproot the international system that uh, uh, emerged after the end of the Cold War. In 2008, Havel gave an interview to one of the largest papers in this country, and he said, the Putin's regime combines in itself the West of capitalism with the West of communism. And as such, it is an unprecedented threat to, you know, our way of uh, of uh, 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 liberal democracy, our way of uh, of living, and and he didn't just put in. I mean, didn't just talk the talk. He walked the walk with Georgia, with Ukraine in in 2014, and and now. And I, I wrote an op-ed piece last May, and uh, and I said in the piece, I mean, <coughs> Russians are going to invade Ukraine uh, around the end of the year, and they're going to invade in force, not trying to snatch a little piece there. Or, and and how did I know? I had no I had no access to intelligence, but I. I was around in 1968 when the invasion of Czechoslovakia in August 1968 was preceded by staff exercises called Bermerwald, Shumava, right? Uh, in which the Soviets, you know, planned the logistics, the, uh, you know, the staging points, etc., etc., and then withdrew. And Several months later, they came back with half a million, half a million troops. It was, it was not even rocket science, you know, and no more than it was rocket science after uh, reading Mein Kampf, uh, what Hitler was had in mind had in mind to do. Of course, you are right that history is an open book, so there was always. Uh, a possibility that Hitler would get run over by car, or, or you know, Putin, what, uh, whatever. But uh, you know, f we we did have the evidence, and we did not respond to the evidence, which, you know, it, it's it's. I'm not even, you know, radically critical of that because I think it's in human nature. Uh, not to believe that uh, the West will happen. You know, we always find reasons not to believe that, you know, bad things will happen. But for a political scientist, for a geopolitician, you know, the truth is that, you know, they do happen. They do happen, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, we have uh, time for maybe two last questions. And, and we have about, yeah, the lady. <coughs> and we can also Hello. take them all three. Uh, and then, and then. Sure. Okay, let's do that. Please. Uh, 
Thank you for your discussion so far. My name is Susanna. I'm an alumni of Leiden. I Please did, speak uh, into the mic. Sorry, is it? Oh, right. Is, <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your discussion so far this evening. It's been very, uh, very interesting. Uh, my name is Susanna. I'm an alumni of Leiden University. I did political science and Russian studies. Um, so <laughs> it's, I now live here and it's, uh, it's an emotional time and I'm very happy to be living in Prague uh, in a country that's uh, doing its best uh, and taking a, a, a big role in, 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 this, uh, in these events uh, in taking place in Europe. My question is not not concerning Russia or Ukraine. My question is more concerning um, populism. And uh, you spoke about the, the elections coming up here uh, for the president. Um, you spoke about getting through winter. Um, and um, I'm sort of wondering whether this, this, these geopolitical stories and saying we need more of them how how much of an elitist story is that that will resonate with well the, the certain parts of the population but will not resonate with the possible uh, the, the people who might vote for Babish um, and would more of this uh, geopolitical story would that help not just here in Czech but would it help in, in the Netherlands as well um, to, to unite the people behind our common project uh, and in a geopolitical sense against Russia? Um, and then I think the third thing would be combining geopolitics and populations has a bit of a, has always had negative consequences in our 20th century history. <laughs> um, yeah, I think they've been responsible for a lot of bloodshed as well. So how, how do we go about that? Okay. We'll take two or three questions uh, and then Professor van Middelaar will answer uh, the young man here. Uh, Mr. van Middelaar, Mr. Zantowski, Thank you for your thought-provoking words. Uh, Mr. Von Mindler, earlier you mentioned uh, that in the eyes of the US, uh, Africa is seen as a playground in its great power struggle with China. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on this and perhaps describe Africa's uh, role in this age of geopolitics. All right, the gentleman behind you was also wanting to ask a question. <coughs> Right, thank you. Um, you spoke about how the EU, uh, as a response to this site event, has become more of a single, like unified actor when it comes to foreign policy and security. But it seems to me that at the same time, the EU, like internally, is still very much divided over things like fiscal policy or immigration or the rule of law. So my question is, can a more geopolitical EU also be an EU which at the same time is like, internally more divided about its internal politics? Yeah, you take the first, the first and the last, and I will try to respond to the second. Okay. Good. You, okay. You take playground Africa. Uh, no, Susanna, thank you for your question. Also on on uh, on, on populism and how does it? Uh, in a way, I guess you, you, your question is. Uh, how can we avoid uh, wrong people winning the elections uh, because of this war and the impact it had, uh, has on people's uh, energy bills and on uh, inflation? And, and uh, your suggestion was, <laughs> so the populists say, well, we have to stop the war at whatever cost. And your suggestion, I think, uh, is to say, well, can we maybe bring out the stakes more clearly uh, of this war and why we are uh, outside Ukraine. We are not fighting this war directly, uh, but we are supporting the fight uh, of Ukraine in this war, why we are doing this. 
and why we are uh, taking in some of the, the cost and pain to our economies and, and societies. And I, I, I fully agree. I think that case has been made uh, much more forcefully in a way by, by uh, President Zelensky than by many uh, European leaders to their own uh, public opinions. And that is, uh, is a weakness. And, and they will not uh, get away with it uh, for so long and until in the end. In a way, the Italian elections, which we have seen, had <clears throat> an interesting outcome in the to the extent that uh, within the, the right-wing bloc, which was clearly destined to win these elections, uh, uh, it was the most, uh, uh, let's say, anti-Russian voice most pro-Western voice, I will not say pro-European voice clearly, but anti-Russian voice, Maloney, Georgia Maloney, mm -hmm. who won. Uh, partly for that reason. Uh, uh, whereas uh, Berlusconi and, and uh, Salvini were really buddies of, of Putin and they did not get away uh, with that. So that was uh, a sign that also in Italy, a country uh, where they love to love peace, uh, strong Catholic and, and uh, tradition, this played a role in, in, in the election, as it may well here. Your other question is, is too big for the 30 seconds or one minute. It is, uh, but in a way there you were saying, well, is it not dangerous to talk about identity uh, as Maybe you were referring to, to my triptych of uh, geopolitics is, is power and territory and, and also collective identity. Well, uh, yes and no, but it's, it, it's also dangerous not to try and, and, and appeal to people in a group, be it in our national societies or be it Europeans as a whole, as a kind of we, because all others are doing so, and then we can, and they are uh, Xi Jinping and, and Putin and Erdogan also, interestingly, eh? they're all bringing up their country's history and their heroes, uh, like we see in this room, to project their power onto uh, the global uh, stage. Um, and if we, in a way, <coughs> do not even allow ourselves uh, to do that, then we, we have already uh, lost uh, the first half of, of, of the game. Let's, let's put it uh, that way. We have, I'm pleased to say, we have limited the number of uh, football metaphors uh, tonight, uh, but you will grant me this one. On the, well, can the EU be a strong geopolitical actor if it is so divided on many other uh, internal issues? Will be pretty difficult, yes. Uh, let's also be clear about that. Uh, geopolitics is not only about sending uh, creative, nice, strong, uh, tough declarations, huh? but there's also money matters behind it. There are so discussion on finances. There is value matters uh, behind it and, and, and credibility as well, if you want to speak, speak in the name of, of, of uh, democracy uh, and, and rule of law to the outside world. So then should we also be more credible uh, internally, all this in a way goes uh, together. So uh, geopolitics is not just one uh, element. You can only be as Europe, or maybe you would prefer as the West, but you can be a strong geostrategic actor if, if, if you manage to, in a way, um, bring all these elements together, and, and clearly uh, the EU uh, is um, under the impression of events and shocks uh, capable of more than it thought itself, uh, collectively. And I have been in, in meetings of European leaders when I worked for the European Council president, and they, afterwards, they were surprised in a way what they had decided together. They were forced to do things, to jump over their own shadows, to save something of what they hold dearly together. But it is always, uh, let's again, 
under the, the spur or the impression of, of, of the moment or of some other near-death experience, and there is not enough strategic uh, foresight and, and um, which uh, should change. And, and that is my bridge to Africa, where we also need maybe more of that. All right, uh, I will be very brief on, on, on that question because it's, uh, Africa is only a, an aspect of that question now. Obviously, the relationship between uh, the United States and China and to a lesser extent Europe has uh, become extremely competitive and in some part adversarial. And, uh, and in some ways, it is uh, resembling the great game of the 19th century. It's uh, a competition for resources, for... Uh, for trading opportunities, for export opportunities, uh, uh, everything from precious earths to, uh, to you know, the most uh, uh, modern uh, technologies, etc., etc. In itself, it's not yet a, a relationship that inevitably leads to war, you know, because I don't, and I may be wrong about it, and there are sinologists at this university who are more radical about it than, than I am, I don't see the imperialist uh, momentum in Chinese foreign policy, you know, the idea to export the Sino world to the rest of the S, like the Putin's idea to, you know, make the Russian world, as he calls it, expand. That's an imperialist idea. The Chinese are at least more tactful about it, but maybe they, 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 they don't really have that in mind. And that brings me to one moment that Luke mentioned early on. Uh, the real world trade-offs between uh, values and uh, economic and interests, be it economic interests or not, others in dealing with, with China. And uh, I think it's too often simplified into a, a zero-sum game. You know, you criticize Chinese for the human rights abuses or you trade with them. It's not like that. I mean, the Chinese have not just their pride and their nationalism, they have their interests too. And uh, Havel was a great experimenter, so to speak, uh, in, in this respect, because he, you know, one of his first presidential acts was to invite the Dalai Lama to come uh, uh, to Prague for a visit and, you know, we were warned by the Chinese diplomats that this would be the end of the earth uh, if, if that happened. It happened, you know, not, not much happened and the trade went on pretty much as usual. The same with our uh, uh, dealings uh, with uh, Taiwan, which is today one of our larger economic uh, partners, unlike China, which uh, was promised by some politicians uh, uh, in this country to become our savior, and, uh, and they went, you know, bent over backwards to bring the Chinese president here. So not much has happened, not, uh, not, uh, not any miracle has happened. And so I, I think that to a degree there are limits there, but to a degree we can afford to be open and critical about what we don't accept about uh, the Chinese way of doing things and still do trade with China. And I will make a last heretical remark and I always get into trouble over football for some reason, I don't know, I'm not even a great football fan, but do you really believe that if the European teams 
wore the rainbow patch on their shoulders that the championship would collapse or wouldn't happen, that Qatar would say, you know, off with you. I, I don't believe this for a, for a minute, you know, and I, I thought how, how, how naive can, can we sometimes be about these things, or some people can be. So uh, I'll end on this before I get even into even more trouble. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we passed the seventh hour, as, uh, and I promise that we'll end about here, but I have, in spite of all the troubling problems we've discussed, I have some good news for you. The rector of the university is inviting all of us uh, for a glass of wine in the next room. So you will have an opportunity to uh, speak to Professor van Middelaar uh, in about uh, the remaining questions you may have. And in the meantime, let me thank Luke. And 